Welcome back. This time talking about endocrine responses to resistance exercise. So remember that if we're talking about the endocrine system, we're talking about hormones. As we discussed in 201 and 202, there are two major control systems to the body, the first one being the nervous system, and then the second one being the endocrine system. So remember that some of the key differentiators, so the nervous system, um, is comprised of neurons, right? And so it is kind of the immediate response system. As opposed to the endocrine system, you can get some really rapid responses. So for example, if you're scared um, you're, or startled is another way to say that, um, you're going to start to almost instantaneously start to secrete epinephrine, norepinephrine, which are gonna increase your heart rate, um, increase the contractility of the heart, those kind of things. So it does happen or it can happen pretty fast on the endocrine side, just not quite as fast, just not in milliseconds like we're gonna see with the nervous system. But nonetheless, the most important thing to know at the outset or the most important thing to recall at the outset is that the endocrine system involves hormones. So hormones are chemical messengers or signal molecules that are synthesized, stored, and released into the blood or lymph by endocrine glands. Um, body structures that are specialized for that function, that's what an endocrine gland is, or certain other cells. So those uh, endocrine glands or endocrine tissue, so as we'll talk here in a second, other organs have endocrine tissue in them. They may serve, like, so for example, the heart. Um, so the heart, we all know that it's a pump at this point, but in addition to functioning as a pump, the right atrium secretes a particular hormone that has the effect of reducing blood pressure, right? And so then the heart, even though its main job is to be the pump of blood, it's one of its side jobs or one of the things that it can do to help its function in the main job is to secrete hormones. So it has some endocrine tissue in it um, or some endocrine glands, I guess is a better way of saying that. It has some endocrine glands in it. Um, as opposed to things like your thyroid gland, that's an endocrine gland. It's dedicated to the production and release of thyroid hormones. Um, so if we're dumping those hormones into the, into the blood or into the lymphatic system, if they get dumped into the lymphatic side, eventually they're gonna end up in the blood. Um, but what happens then is those hormones, those chemical messengers circulate in the blood and then they have the opportunity to interact with tissues throughout the body. But an important point that I'll say more than once during this talk is that the hormones only exert their effect on tissues or cells that have a receptor for that particular hormone. So even though a hormone like testosterone gets distributed throughout the body, only the cells that have receptors for testosterone are able to receive the message and then react to that message. So on that second bullet point there where it says target cells must have receptors for hormones to exert their effects, that's what I'm talking about. So um, now that said, most hormones affect multiple body tissues. So for example, to use testosterone again, testosterone is gonna affect not only skeletal muscle tissue that we're familiar with, right? It tends to um, increase protein synthesis, which results in larger, stronger muscles. But in addition to that, testosterone is gonna exert an effect on the bones. So uh, testosterone in boys is the hormonal trigger for that adolescent growth spurt combined with growth hormone, but, but uh, testosterone is going to play a key role in that adolescent growth spurt as well as the closure of the growth plates, so it affects bone. Uh, testosterone also affects neurons, right? So it affects multiple different kinds of cells or multiple different kinds of tissues. And testosterone is not alone in that, and we'll talk more about some other ones later. So um, hormonal signals can do a variety of different things. One of the things, so uh, We'll stick with testosterone. I'll switch hormones in a second, I guess. Um, but the first thing that hormonal signals can cause is anabolism, right? So we talked about anything that's anabolic means to build. So um, an anabolic steroid is a particular type of hormone. It's a cholesterol derivative that then um, causes tissue building, right? So anything anabolic is gonna cause tissue building. So for example, testosterone is gonna cause, as mentioned a second ago, increased protein synthesis, so it'll cause increased size of skeletal muscles. Similarly, um, insulin is an anabolic hormone. So insulin is a hormone that's released by the pancreas in response to an increase in blood glucose. And what it causes is um, receptors in skeletal muscle and in adipose tissue in particular to take glucose out of the blood and pull it into muscles so we can store it as glycogen or convert it to fat. 
And it also can cause uh, adipocytes, your fat cells, to pull glucose out of the blood again so, so that we can convert it to fat. Um, and so we're building up tissue, right? We're, we're building glycogen, we're building uh, intramuscular fat, or we're building fat inside of the adipocytes. So insulin then is also an anabolic hormone, so it causes us to build things up. I'm actually going to skip permissive for a second. Catabolic hormones break things down. So remember catabolism, we're breaking down. So um, one of the primary catabolic hormones that we talk about in an exercise context is cortisol. And so cortisol is a sometimes referred to as a stress hormone uh, because it's released during times of stress, but that includes exercise. And so one of the things that cortisol does is causes you to um, convert protein to glucose, for example. So it's, it's trying to free up energy because to the body in, in many ways, psychological stress, physical stress, they're all stress, right? They all, they all require extra fuel. They all require a response from the cardiovascular system so that we can be prepared to fight or flight. So again, whether that's psychological stress or you know, physical or exercise type stress, the responses are pretty similar. And so when cortisol is released, it's gonna cause us to break down muscle, for example, and convert those proteins to glucose so that we have fuel for exercise. Um, so that would be an example of a catabolic hormone. A permissive hormone is one that allows others to exert their effect. So for example, um, thyroid hormone is, um, when it's released, it's going to cause an increase in epinephrine receptors, especially in cardiac muscle. And so with more epinephrine receptors in cardiac muscle, then that amplifies the effects that epinephrine would otherwise exert. So they serve sort of a synergistic um, role together where um, because of thyroid hormone, epinephrine can exert its effects more effectively. And so that is a permissive hormone. Um, another way of thinking about that is that uh, the presence of one hormone, in that case thyroid hormone, is required for another to exert its effect. Um, one of the other things that we can do um, other than releasing extra hormones. So you see that, you know, for example, with, with insulin is you get a larger insulin response with a larger increase in blood glucose. So another thing that we can do other than just increasing the volume of a particular hormone that we release is that we can increase the receptors. So you can upregulate the receptors for that hormone. And so we see that, for example, with testosterone um, in response to certain types of resistance training. Um, you can upregulate the, the number of androgen receptors so that the same volume of testosterone, in that case, exerts a, an amplified effect. So if we alter our training variables, and those may include things like the intensity, so you lift heavier weights, the number of sets, so that's really volume, the order of the exercises, uh, the exercise selection, so big muscle exercises like squats and deadlifts versus small muscle exercises like um, forearm curls, um, or if we manipulate the rest periods, that's going to dictate the hormonal responses to exercise. So as we'll talk about in a little bit, there are ways to amplify the release of growth hormone in response to a particular exercise session. So with growth hormone, um, that is, appears to be, I was going to say, yeah, whatever, anyway, that appears to be a uh, responsive to relatively short rest periods. So if you're doing things like your 10 repetition maximum for uh, or with one minute or less of rest between sets, that appears to cause a larger release of growth hormone than we would see if we did lighter weights, so more like your 20 rep max, or if we had longer rest between sets, like three or five minutes between sets. So the um, Manipulating those variables, then the intensity of the exercise, the selection, the more, the more muscle mass you activate, the, more, um, the larger the endocrine response tends to be, especially with respect to uh, things like testosterone and growth hormone. So I guess the larger the anabolic um, hormone release tends to be um, with those larger muscle groups, shorter rest periods, higher intensity, those kinds of things. And so why that matters then is that last little bullet point there that tissue adaptations are influenced by hormonal concentrations after exercise. So in theory, and this is one of the things that um, certain research groups are, are kind of going after these days, but, but in theory, um, the more testosterone you release or the higher your peak testosterone after exercise, that should be related to or correlated to an increase in muscle protein synthesis, which should then be uh, correlated to 
a bigger increase in muscle hypertrophy following that resistance training program. So the idea there is that we can manipulate training variables to elicit these hormonal responses to facilitate improvements in muscle size, muscle strength, muscle power, et cetera. So that's kind of the idea that we're getting at here with this chapter. All right, so as mentioned, hormones are synthesized by endocrine glands, so particular glands that are dedicated to that. So for example, the adrenal glands, um, that are situated atop the kidneys. So the adrenal glands, there's the adrenal cortex, which is the outer portion of that, and then there's the adrenal medulla, which is the inner portion of that, and each of those releases different hormones. But the adrenal glands themselves are dedicated to the production of uh, particular hormones. So things like epinephrine, norepinephrine, uh, cortisol, and then aldosterone. All those are uh, adrenal hormones. The pituitary gland is in the brain. And so pituitary hormones include things like human growth hormone, gonadotropic hormones. So gonadotropic hormones um, cause the release of um, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, and testosterone. The pituitary also releases ACTH. Let's see if I can remember what the acronym stands for, adrenocorticotropic hormone. Um, and so any and you've heard this part before, but any hormone that's a tropic hormone is one that causes the release of other hormones. So ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, causes the release of cortisol and aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. So that's why it's adrenal corticotropic, um, because it, it stimulates the adrenal cortex and it's a tropic hormone causing the release of others. So those are your some of your endoc endocrine glands. Um, and then as mentioned a minute ago, there are organs that do other things, but also release hormones. So for example, with the pancreas, the pancreas serves a digestive function. It um, synthesizes and releases um, pancreatic juice, which plays a really important role in the breakdown of fats and proteins in particular. But in addition to its digestive function, the pancreas also releases or synthesizes and releases both insulin to lower your blood sugar and glucagon to increase your blood sugar. So the, the pancreas plays a really important role in the digestive system, but it also plays a really important endocrine role of regulating blood sugar. Um, I mentioned the heart and um, its hormone that the right atrium releases, atrial natur, this one even I have a pr problem pronouncing, it's ANP. Uh, is the short or the, is the acronym, but it's atrial natur naturetic uh, peptide, ANP. Um, so the name natiuretic um, deals with diuresis. So if you if you diurese, you get rid of fluids, right? So um, through urination. And so what ANP does? So again, uh, it's on the or secreted by the right atrium of the heart, the right atrium, remember, is the first chamber that blood enters when it's coming back from the body. And so if blood pressure is too high, the right atrium is going to sense that coming back from the body. And so it's going to release that hormone, ANP. And so what ANP is going to do then is to cause us to um, excrete more water to try to reduce blood volume, to try to reduce blood pressure. So basically, it's going to cause diuresis. It'll cause you to get rid of water. Um, so there's all those. In terms of neurons, so some neurotransmitters have hormonal functions. So for example, oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone are synthesized in the neurons of the hypothalamus, and then they're released into the pituitary and then picked up in, in capillaries there. Um, so some hormones are actually directly synthesized by neurons. Similarly, there are hormones that are referred to as neurohormones. So for example, epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, those can be released as neurotransmitters, but they can also, so they can actually be released from neurons and have the function of, they function as neurotransmitters. But in addition to that, they can also be released by the adrenal glands and then have a hormonal or have an endocrine function. So in that case, um, doing things like causing vasoconstriction is, is one of the, their endocrine functions. All right, you've actually seen this slide before. So, the way that we control blood levels of hormones is by negative feedback systems. So the classic example here would be with insulin. So if your blood glucose gets too high, we're gonna release a bunch of insulin. That will then cause the uptake of glucose into muscle cells and into adipocytes. And then once blood glucose gets back within normal limits, we stop secreting insulin and we're good to go. 
right? And so that's, that's the negative feedback loop. Once we're back within normal limits, we shut off secretion, and then we just continue there. And then if blood glucose goes the other way, drops too low, then the pancreas is gonna secrete glucagon, the other side of things, and so that's gonna cause the liver to break down glycogen and release that into the blood, and that'll get our blood sugar back up, or our blood glucose back up, and then once it's back within normal limits, we stop secreting glucagon in that case. Um, in terms of stimulating the release of hormones, so there are kind of three primary mechanisms there. The first is humoral stimulation. And so humoral stimulation, anything humoral is blood. And so um, the example I just, examples I just gave you were humoral stimulation, that there was too little or too much glucose in the blood, and in response to that, that initiated the release of glucagon in the case of too little, insulin in the case of too much. Uh, the example there on A is uh, parathyroid hormone, which parathyroid hormone is released in response to too little calcium in the blood, causes the breakdown of, of bone to free up calcium and get our blood calcium back up. We can also get uh, neural stimulation. So what you see there, um, on B, that's the spinal cord, this is your adrenal gland. And so um, what's happening there is in response to some sort of a psychological stimulus, so maybe I'm frightened, I'm nervous because I have to give a public presentation, something like that, um, in response to that psychological stress, um, then the brain is going to initiate the release of stress hormones, including things like epinephrine, norepinephrine, so that's what's gonna cause that increase in heart rate, increase in breathing rate, et cetera. Um, and then, same kind of thing, in, in anticipation of exercise, so you know, if I'm at the starting line of a cross-country race, my heart rate's gonna be elevated over resting because I'm anticipating the exercise, so cognitively, like I, I know that this race is getting ready to start, and so that then has the effect of increasing heart rate, and one of the ways that we can do that is by initiating the release of epinephrine, norepinephrine. And then the last one on there is, is hormonal, stimula hormonal stimulus. So again, tropic hormones cause the release of other hormones. So I mentioned that adrenocorticotropic hormone released by the pituitary causes the release of aldosterone and cortisol from the adrenal glands, so it causes the release of others, and then they exert their effects. So the typical function of a hormone was mentioned at the outset, that, that hormones are gonna be released into the blood, they're gonna move through the circulation, any cell or any tissue that has receptors for those hormones, is gonna, it, that hormone will bind to it and then exert its effects. Um, that's the typical endocrine function. But there are some little wrinkles in that. So you can also get intracrine function. So intracrine, so intra is inside. And so cells can produce hormones that are actually released or become active inside of the cell itself. So from an exercise standpoint, the most important example is insulin-like growth factor one, or IGF-1, you'll see that a lot on the slideshow. Um, and so uh, one of the things that IGF-1 does is that it can stimulate protein synthesis, right? So it, it plays a role in muscle growth and in the adaptation of a muscle to a training stimulus, <clears throat> specifically of a muscle cell to a training stimulus. And so, in response to mechanical deformation of the muscle, so when the muscle contracts really strongly, that's gonna cause the production and release inside of the cell of IGF-1. And so that IGF-1 then can bind to receptors in the cytosol or sarcoplasm of a muscle cell, or it can bind to receptors on the nucleus, and then that will change gene expression. So remember, inside of the nucleus is your DNA. Your DNA is the instructions for building proteins. And so in response to a particular exercise stimulus, so muscles contracting really hard, we stimulate the production of IGF-1, which then will cause the activation, if you will, we'll get into more detail later, but it'll cause the activation of um, genes related to synthesizing the proteins actin and myosin. So we'll make more actin, more myosin, and then that'll help us rebuild from exercise. We'll end up with a larger and stronger muscle. So intracrine function is where a cell makes a hormone and then it becomes active in response to a change in the cell. So in the case of the muscle cell, it's a change in shape, um, but it can be a change in um, pH of the cell. There's a number of other triggers that could also be involved. Um, but the, the hormone has 
is synthesized and active inside of one cell. Autocrine function, same thing, except that the receptor for the cell is on the cell's membrane. So in the intracrine function, the receptor for the cell is actually in the cytosol, again, or on the nucleus. So you actually synthesize the hormone, and then it just kind of moves around inside of the cell to wherever its receptors are. In the case of autocrine function, the hormone actually leaves the cell in terms of crossing the cell's membrane, and then the receptor for that hormone is on the cell's surface or on the cell's membrane, and then that initiates a second messenger cascade so that the hormone can exert its effects. So that's an autocrine function. So we see that primarily in immune cells, that um, they can become active in response to receiving that sort of self-signal, um, or that can cause them to clone themselves. So um, in response to, or when they're ramping up uh, in response to you know, some sort of invading pathogen, a virus or bacteria, something like that, autocrine function can play an important role in signaling those immune cells to make copies of themselves. Paracrine function is where um, that hormone is released, but it's just received by the adjacent cell, so the cells right next to the one that released it. So we see that with things like um, blood clotting, so that'll play a role in the platelets um, aggregating to form a clot, but we also see that um, in development, um, so like fibroblasts, the um, immature cells that help lay down collagen and that are really active in different types of connective tissue. Um, Fibroblasts will signal to each other to synthesize collagen, and so that plays an important role in development and in dictating the structure of limbs uh, in particular, but also dictating the, the structure of the spinal cord as well. So that's paracrine signaling. So from top to bottom, then intracrine, we synthesize the hormone inside of the cell, the receptors are inside of the cell, and so the hormone stays inside of the cell itself. Autocrine, synthesize the hormone inside of the cell, but it gets kicked out but received by the same cell on the surface, and then paracrine, synthesize the hormone, release it, but it's only received by neighboring cells. It doesn't actually go fully into the bloodstream and circulate the entire body. That's paracrine signaling. All right, binding proteins. So a lot of hormones have to be carried in the blood by a binding protein. Um, and so, for example, one of the most important ones for exercise, if you're looking at like um, adaptations endocrine adaptations to resistance training, one of the more common ones that you'll see is sex hormone binding globulin, and the acronym for that is SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin. Um, and so that's the binding protein for testosterone and estrogen. And so what those um, binding proteins do is they help protect the uh, hormone from degradation, so they help keep it from being broken down. Kind of one of the ways of envisioning um, these binding proteins is as sort of a, a storage site for the hormone inside of the blood. So we've already got this hormone synthesized and ready to go. We can store it in the blood rather than having to have that lag time of having to make the hormone from scratch in a cell and then secrete it into the blood and then let it circulate. So that's kind of one of the ways of thinking about it. The hormones are already there, they're already in the blood, but they're not active because they're bound to that binding protein. Um, so typically what happens is that um, in order for hormones to be active, they have to be separated from that specific binding protein. So that's where you see, um, if you watch a lot of ESPN like I do, there's a lot of like, a lot of ads with Frank Thomas in them, right? For different, um, different supplements that are supposed to increase your testosterone levels. And so they talk about free testosterone. And so what they mean then is free as opposed to bound testosterone, because the bound testosterone isn't gonna be able to be active until it becomes unbound, right? But then it's gonna degrade faster. So um, both steroid hormones, which means that they're a cholesterol derivative, and peptide hormones, which means that they're a protein derivative, both of those will have binding proteins that attach to them. And then the binding proteins themselves may have their own biological actions. So for example, that, that uh, binding protein I mentioned earlier, sex hormone binding globulin, what it'll do is to, after it, it um, releases testosterone or after it releases estrogen, it can bind to specific membrane receptors and then initiate a second messenger system um, and then alter the metabolism of a cell or alter gene expression in the cell. So it may cause the uh, production of more, um, more proteins, for example. So it may stimulate protein synthesis in its own right, for example. 
So as mentioned earlier, most hormones play multiple physiological roles. So for example, cortisol, one of the stress hormones, um, it's going to break down muscle to uh, free up or cause the uh, initiation of a process called gluconeogenesis, which is the creation of glucose from proteins. So that's one of the things it can do. It can break down muscle, but it also inhibits the immune system. It also inhibits um, repair of cartilage and other connective tissues. So, because um, basically what, what cortisol is doing is it, it says the body's under stress. We just need energy. We just need to get through this. We don't need immune function right now. We can worry about that later. We just need to get uh, away from whatever this danger is. And so that's why it's problematic if cortisol is released in high levels all the time, is that it, it um, hampers that repair process of you know building the bones back up, building the cartilage back up after an exercise bout. Um, it, it's constantly, if, if you release too much cortisol too consistently, then the body's in breakdown mode all the time. So that's why you kind of hear that, that psychological stress is, is bad, because of course it is, um, if, if it occurs for prolonged periods of time, because basically the body is in kind of panic or breakdown mode all the time, and then you can't build things back up, right? And so cortisol is one of the important hormones involved in that. So as it pertains to this particular slide, though, cortisol is going to exert multiple effects on multiple different tissues. And most hormones are like that. So if we're looking at what happens inside of a muscle cell or, or the damage and repair process, so if we go and engage in resistance training, we're going to lift some pretty heavy weights, we're going to cause damage to the muscle cell itself. So remember, um, by causing the muscle to contract more strongly than it's used to contracting, we're going to cause damage to the sarcolemma, which is the muscle cell's membrane. And then that's going to initiate an inflammatory process. So that's the immune response. Then those immune cells are going to come through and, and um, get rid of, dispose of those damaged proteins. So those include, you're going to have some damage to the actin and myosin. You're going to have some damage to um, the Z discs, Titan, a number of other things, right? And so the immune cells are going to come in and clean that up. And then that is initiated by hormones, right? So that's the hormones are going to play an important role in um, signaling those immune cells. And then once we've cleaned everything up, then we will get the migration of uh, satellite cells to the area. They're going to form their little myotubes like we talked about in 201. And then we're going to synthesize more actin, more myosin, and we're going to rebuild more uh, myofibrils. So um, as mentioned, a lot of that process is dictated by hormonal responses. So for example, IGF-1s, when we talked about intracrine signaling. So IGF-1s are going to dictate some of that process. Um, testosterone is probably going to dictate some of that process. Because again, it, you can see an increased release of testosterone in response to resistance training. It'll then, uh, after it's released, migrate to muscle tissue, among others. When it's received there, that'll cause um, increased protein synthesis, so particularly of the contractile proteins, but it also caused the satellite cells, which the satellite cells in muscles, those are the, the repair cells. They're, they're a type of stem cell, so they're an immature cell that can differentiate into others, and it'll cause those stem cells to make copies of themselves, or the satellite cells to make copies of themselves. And the more copies of them you have, the faster you can repair a muscle, and then the, the uh, more pronounced the muscle growth tends to be. So, for example, um, one of the reasons you hear um, athletes talk about taking anabolic steroids is not necessarily because they want to get huge, but because they can recover from exercise faster. And part of that recovery is the ability to um, cause those stem cells, those satellite cells, to make more copies of themselves so that they can repair a muscle faster, right? And so that's one of the things that testosterone does is cause the proliferation of those cells. Um, and so anabolic hormones are going to, going to contribute to various parts of that process. Um, so that includes testosterone, as I keep using, but also insulin plays an important role in that in, in restoring the glycogen that you've broken down. Insulin-like growth factors stimulate protein synthesis, and the growth hormone as well can stimulate protein synthesis inside of a muscle cell. And then thyroid hormones are going to play a role, that permissive role that we talked about, um, in allowing some of those anabolic hormones to function. So they may help with the upregulation of receptors for androgens, for example, and then that'll allow for um, more effective protein synthesis. So we talked about some of this stuff previously, because there's a, and as I was 
reading it. There's at least one question in the test bank about this. Um, so the signal from a hormone, and thereby its biological effect, is relayed only to cells that express the receptor for that hormone. So again, we're just going to dump hormones into the blood, and then those hormones exert their effect on the cells that have the receptors for it. So that's the lock and key theory. It says that the hormone can only be active, the hormone is, is the key, can only be active on particular locks, which is the receptors in that analogy. The receptors might be on the surface of a cell in the case of peptide hormones, which are proteins. So those proteins can't diffuse across a cell's membrane because they're big and they are not fat soluble. So they're stuck on the outside of the cell. So in the case of peptide or protein hormones, their receptor is on the cell's surface. As opposed to steroid hormones and thyroid hormones, those are fat soluble. So they can actually diffuse inside of a cell, and then the receptors for those hormones are either in the cytosol or on the nucleus. Uh, as mentioned, uh, so there is some variability in receptors. So we can either upregulate them, which means to increase their number. Um, so for example, um, in response to resistance training, men typically see a, a more pronounced increase in testosterone post-resistance training than women do, but women show a greater increase in uh, receptors for testosterone or receptors for androgens after resistance training. So women appear to respond to resistance training by upregulating the number of receptors for androgens, whereas men uh, can't do, do that, but also you see a more pronounced increase in the release of androgens. So upregulation is increasing the number of receptors, which makes the existing signal more effective. Downregulation is decreasing the number of receptors. So for downregulation, classic example there is um, in type 2 diabetes. If somebody you know, has chronically high blood glucose, they're going to chronically be releasing insulin. Um, so what I always think of when I say that their blood glucose is chronically elevated, um, is somebody who goes to the convenience store, to Quick Trip for example, and buys like a giant jug of soda and just drinks a little bit of soda all day long, right? You're gonna get this, this chronic elevation in blood glucose and so you get chronic release of insulin. And so basically what happens is that the muscle cells get less receptive to that insulin. Um, they downregulate the number of receptors. So uh, the pancreas then has to keep secreting more and more insulin to get the same response. So because of the downregulation of receptors, you have to get a, a bigger response from the pancreas in terms of releasing that hormone. Um, I guess on the other side of things, in response to exercise, particularly fasted exercise, you're going to see an upregulation in receptors for insulin so that we can more effectively get glucose into the working muscle cells. So I touched on this a second ago. So the three main categories of hormones, so steroid hormones, cholesterol derivatives, uh, and again, the important thing there is that they're fat soluble and they can move right through a cell's membrane, as opposed to peptide hormones, they're big proteins, they gotta stay on the outside, uh, and then amine hormones. So amine hormones we're not really gonna talk about. So because steroid hormones can get inside of a muscle cell, again, their receptor is inside or they can get inside of all cells, um, but their receptors are in the cytoplasm or in the sarcoplasm of a muscle cell. So something like testosterone, again, is going to diffuse across the sarcolemma, across the cell's membrane, and then it's going to bind to a receptor in the cytosol or in the, the sarcoplasm of a cell to form a hormone receptor complex, which is the HRC. And so once that hormone and the receptor have formed that HRC complex, that complex is then going to migrate to the nucleus and then there may be a second receptor complex, depends on the hormone. Um, but at any rate, eventually it's going to get inside of the uh, nucleus and cause the opening of DNA. And then when that particular hormone sees the relevant gene, remember that genes are the instructions for building a protein. Let's say the protein is myosin. So whenever it, on the DNA strand, comes across the instructions to build myosin, it's going to make a copy of that. And so then that's when you get your, that's transcription. And so that's when you create your messenger RNA. Messenger RNA migrates outside of the nucleus. It's the instructions. It says, hey, this is how we build myosin. Then you're going to get uh, ribosome, ribosomal RNA, or rRNA is going to attach to that. And then 
so the ribosome reads the instructions and actually does the assembly. And remember, the last RNA is transfer RNA or tRNA. And it, it uh, goes and gets all the amino acids, the building blocks for the protein, and then the ribosomes assemble them according to the instructions on the messenger RNA. And then once, once um, the ribosome is done reading the message and we've built our protein, then the ribosome detaches and now we have a new um, myosin in that case. So what happens then is that a steroid hormone like testosterone will initiate the production of proteins, right? So that's, that's, it'll increase protein synthesis. It's going to make more proteins. And the example I used there would be myosin. Um, there's something else I was going to say about that. I don't know. Probably come to me. And so there's the example there. Um, so there's our testosterone, moves inside of the cell. There's its uh, hormone receptor complex. There's its joining to the second hormone receptor complex. It reads the DNA. And then it says, OK, let's build this protein. And so it has a metabolic effect, which is uh, protein synthesis. But it can do other stuff, um, as you can see here. So for our peptide hormones, the ones that have to stay outside of the cell, they exert their effects through a second messenger system. So basically, because they have to stay on the outside, they're going to attach here. That um, attachment with the key and the lock, to use the earlier analogy, um, causes a conformational shift inside of the cell. All right, so now we're, that's, uh, this part here is the cell's membrane. We're going to initiate that second messenger system. And what's pictured for you here is that the uh, hormone's binding to an external receptor, but that's going to activate this second messenger stat. And then that second messenger can actually enter the nucleus, and then that can cause protein, or cause, sorry, cause gene uh, transcription, and then translation, and then the building of a protein. So um, hormones that act through this include things like growth hormone or insulin. Um, and so for example, insulin, this rather than um, causing the building of, of um, more proteins, one of the, its primary jobs is to cause what's called translocation, cause the movement of the uh, glucose receptors. So it causes the, the translocation of the movement of a particular type of glucose receptor, which is called a GLUT4 receptor, to move from the cytosol to the cell surface so that when it sees glucose, glucose can attach and we can bring it inside of the cell. All right, so what happens with heavy resistance exercise and hormone increases? So as you can see there, long-term consistent heavy resistance training, meaning months to years of training, um, can bring about significant ad adaptive responses that result in enhanced size, strength, and power of the musculature. Heavy resistance exercise recruits large motor units not typically used in activities of daily living. So if you're you know, lifting 85% or more of your uh, one rep max, then that's going to start, that's going to use some of those type 2x fibers that you don't use during the normal things that you do, right? You don't use the type 2x fibers unless you're moving really fast or moving a lot of weight. And so heavy resistance exercise then will stimulate those fibers, um, which then influences the hormonal response that we're going to get after the exercise. So one or two heavy sessions can increase androgen receptors in muscle. But if the stress is too great, the catabolic response, the breakdown response, can exceed the anabolic response. So for example, you see sometimes, or at least I used to read all the time uh, in bodybuilding type literature and muscle magazines, they always talked about how like, you don't want to work out too long. You don't want to work out for like two and a half, three hours because the, the cortisol release that you were going to get as a result of that prolonged workout was going to exceed the anabolic effects of testosterone release spurred by that workout. So you're actually going to break down more muscle than you were able to build. So they always advise for like shorter, more intense sessions to minimize those catabolic effects of cortisol and that prolonged release of cortisol. So in terms of the adaptations of the endocrine system, the adaptations of the endocrine system aren't like what we talked about with the heart, where there's this very obvious, you know, in response to endurance training, the left ventricle gets larger, um, gets more extensible. Um, get stronger, all those kinds of things. The endocrine system adaptations are a little more iffy. Um, so you see there possible adaptations. So it's possible that after chronic resistance training, there may be increased synthesis, so making of or storage of hormones, um, change in the number of receptors. So as mentioned on the last slide, you know you can see an, an upregulation of um, 
androgen receptors in response to resistance training. As mentioned previously, you can see a, an upregulation of uh, insulin receptors in response to either resistance or endurance training. So that's a, that's a probable one. Um, there may be a ch change in size of this uh, secretory cells. So the cells that secrete, um, like so for example in the insulin, in the, sorry, in the case of um, insulin and glucagon, um, the alpha and beta cells in the pancreas, I'm trying to remember, I think beta cells are insulin and alpha cells are glucagon, but that might be reversed. So don't quote me on that, but I won't ask you about it either. <laughs> um, and then other things that might adapt, the magnitude of the, of the signal sent to the cell nucleus by the hormone receptor complex or the secondary messenger system or the transport of hormones via binding proteins. Maybe we make more binding proteins. Maybe we can more effectively transport those hormones in the blood. All right, so getting into specifics here. So things that testosterone does. So testosterone can promote growth hormone release, and then growth hormone can do other things like um, it has an anabolic effect and can cause an increase in protein synthesis, but it also causes a, an increase in lipolysis, which is fat breakdown. Growth hormone helps you stay leaner. Um, other things that testosterone does, so again, it's gonna increase protein synthesis, so you're gonna, you're gonna make more of the proteins uh, actin and myosin, for example, that make the muscle cell larger and stronger. Um, but it also is going to increase the number of satellite cells, which again are the, the cells that repair a damaged muscle cell. So again, we talked about this way back in 201, and you can go back and watch the video if you want. Um, but in response to muscle cell damage, remember that one of the first things that's going to happen is this satellite cell proliferation. They make copies of themselves, and then they form the little myotubes and rebuild the damaged area. So the more satellite cells you have, again, the faster you can repair. Um, one of the other interesting things, though, is that testosterone is going to influence the nervous system. So it's associated with an increase in motor neuron size. So if you have a larger motor neuron, that's a motor neuron that's going to be able to conduct a signal more quickly. So think of it as making a two-lane highway into a four-lane highway. A lot more information can move a lot faster, right? And so with that, um, you're going to get a... Um, more pronounced response from that motor unit. Um, so that's going to effectively um, reduce muscle contraction time. Um, and so that increases power output. I guess that's ultimately why this matters. So you're gonna see an increase in power output. Um, and then if we increase neurotransmitter production, um, so acetylcholine, for example, if we have more acetylcholine in the axon terminal, we can get a larger release of it. We can get a larger and faster response from the muscle cells, so you get faster muscle contraction. And so from influencing the nervous system standpoint, this is actually, um, the, the controversy is, is old now, but um, thinking about uh, what happened with baseball and all of their steroid issues, one of the things that, that kind of got mentioned but downplayed was not only if batters were using anabolic steroids, did it make them larger and stronger and more powerful, but it also reduced their reaction time based on the influences of the nervous system um, from testosterone. So not only do you have an athlete that can swing the bat harder, but he can also react to, oh, this is a breaking ball. I know where I need to put my bat faster. And so then that makes them a better batter. Talked about this earlier. Women have lower serum concentrations, so meaning in the blood, concentrations of testosterone. And they, and they produce less in response to resistance exercise, but they have a, a more pronounced and quicker upregulation of androgen receptors than men do. So this is an important slide because there are several questions in the bank about how to spur testosterone release through exercise. So ways to increase testosterone release based on resistance exercise um, or to increase the number of androgen receptors are listed for you here. So if you use more large muscle group exercises, so again, things like deadlifts, squats, power cleans, total body types of exercises, the more muscle mass that's activated, the larger, the more pronounced the testosterone response. Heavier resistance, so more than 85% of your one rep max is gonna cause a more pronounced release of testosterone. Um, moderate to high volume, so um, somewhere between like your eight and 12 one rep max with multiple sets, so four or more, like four to six probably, multiple exercises. So you do um, you know, squats, leg extensions, and hack squats or something like that, or both. Those will, that combination of things is pretty good. So 
which is kind of your classic bodybuilding workout setup, right? That combination of things um, is going to cause a larger release of, of testosterone. Short rest intervals, things less than a minute. And then if you have two or more years of resistance training or resistance exercise experience, um, you're going to see smaller increases in resting testosterone, but you probably have more androgen receptors. And that number is pretty variable. That moves around pretty quickly, but you probably have more, more androgen receptors. In terms of growth hormone, so it's responsible for a normal development of kids. So um, in kids, so prior to reaching adolescence, growth hormone is what's going to be responsible for those growth spurts where they'll just, you know, shoot up an, an inch um, over the course of, of a couple months, maybe. So those big growth spurts are caused by this pulsatile release of growth hormone. And what growth hormone does, in addition to um, spurring chondroblast activity in the bones, is it also decreases glucose utilization, so sugar usage, um, decreases glycogen synthesis, um, increases lipolysis, so it increases fat breakdown. It's going to increase amino acid uptake by the cells, which then allows them, so it causes the muscle cells, for example, to take more proteins, more amino, sorry, more amino acids, which are the building blocks for proteins, causes them to take more amino acids out of the blood. So now they got the building blocks for these proteins inside of the muscle cells so they can, they can make um, new proteins more readily because they have all the, all the supplies that they need. It also enhances immune cell function, stimulates uh, collagen synthesis and collagen growth. Um, <clears throat> and so that is also going to increase in response to certain stimuli. So I thought I had that on there, but apparently that's in my notes. So things that stimulate growth hormone release are actually pretty similar to what stimulates uh, testosterone release. So the key there, or the keys there, being fairly short rest periods, so again, less than a minute. Um, things that decrease the pH, so make the inside of the muscle cell more acidic. So that can be your relatively high repetition training. Um, so again, um, 8 to 12 to maybe 15 repetitions. You don't want to go too light, but somewhere in that 8 to 12 to 15 range um, with short rest intervals to decrease the pH of the cell, increase that total time under tension. Um, in doing all of those things, those can result in a pronounced increase in growth hormone release. One of the most or one of the more <coughs> effective regimens in spurring growth hormone release appears to be using your 10 repetition maximum with, with one minute rest periods. So um, moderately heavy with short rest periods, again, that's going to cause, especially over the course of multiple sets, that's going to cause a, a pretty pronounced decrease in pH in the, in the muscle cell, cause it to become more acidic, which will then spur growth hormone release, which on the other side in recovery will hopefully help you stimulate uh, protein synthesis and make your muscles larger and stronger. Insulin-like growth factors, we talked about these. Um, so the muscle cells secrete them themselves, but they're also secreted by the liver in response to the release of growth hormone. Um, and, as mentioned, they're released by the muscle cells themselves, but also fat tissue in response to uh, deformation. Um, and we talked about what it does inside of the muscle. It increases protein synthesis in response to deformation of the muscle. Cortisol, so I mentioned this is the, the classic stress hormone. So it's released by the adrenal cortex. So again, your adrenal glands sit atop your kidneys on either side. Um, the outside of the adrenal glands called the adrenal cortex. It releases two hormones. Um, cortisol and then aldosterone. Aldosterone, this chapter doesn't talk about it, but what it does is causes sodium reabsorption in the kidneys, and so it, it helps you hang on to your fluid volume. So there's kind of two, two hormones that play a really important role in maintaining blood volume. One is aldosterone, and the other one's antidiuretic hormone. But as it pertains to this, um, cortisol released by the adrenal cortex, the outside of the adrenal gland, um, as mentioned, it's going to stimulate the conversion of amino acids, so proteins in muscle, to carbohydrates. And that process is called gluconeogenesis, creation of new sugar or creation of new glucose. Um, it's going to inhibit protein synthesis, so it inhibits repair of muscle, inhibits repair of bone, cartilage, etc. Suppresses immune cell function, um, and its release increases with exercise, um, so especially with high volume short rest kind of stuff. Um, so the same things, so, so during that workout that I was describing to you earlier to stimulate the release of growth hormone, um, during the actual bout of exercise, you're going to be releasing a lot of um, cortisol. And so hopefully, 
after the exercise, the anabolic effects of the testosterone and the growth hormone will outweigh or inhibit the effects of cortisol, the, the catabolic hormone, primary catabolic hormone. And then the last one, the catecholamines, so epinephrine, norepinephrine. So those are re released by the inside of the adrenal gland, the adrenal medulla. And so those are gonna do things like increase your heart rate, increase your blood pressure, because they increase the contractility of the left ventricle in particular. Um, they're gonna help break down sugar and free that up so you have fuel for exercise. Because epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, known as formerly as adrenaline and noradrenaline respectively. Um, so as you probably know, right, if you release adrenaline, increase heart rate, increase contractility, free up sugar because you release adrenaline when you're startled or during exercise. Um, because we're trying to mobilize as much fuel as we can to supply the muscle's needs during that exercise. So we mobilize fuels, so increased energy availability. Um, but they also augment the release of testosterone. Um, which again is gonna play a key role on the other side in helping rebuild and recover from the exercise. So that is it for the endocrine system. That was longer than I expected. Let's see how long. Oh, 50 minutes, not terrible. Um, so that's it for that. And then we'll move on to chapter five next time. So good luck on the chapters three and four quiz.